The FDA's mission to protect and promote public health is wide ranging, covering an enormous array of areas of oversight and responsibilities. One of the most critical of these responsibilities and the focus of today's symposium is ensuring that drug products marketed in the U.S. are safe, effective, and of high quality. American patients and consumers deserve to be confident in the safety, efficacy, and quality of the drug products they take. And the FDA works diligently to ensure this reliability and trust in our processes. Each of these areas of focus comes with its own challenges, both in terms of defining standards and meeting them. The concepts of safety and efficacy are complicated and require extrapolation from the clinical trials that comprise the body of evidence required for approval for marketing. However, the subtlety and multifaceted nature of product quality is often underappreciated by the public and definitely underappreciated by many academics who focus only on the clinical data. It's quality that ensures a patient can trust their next dose as much as their last. Today's symposium will focus on this aspect of the FDA's work and shed additional light on the tools and methods we employ to make this assurance possible. These tools include the quality assessment, developing and producing policy to guide industry, supply chain surveillance, and staying at the forefront of emerging and advanced technologies. You'll be hearing about each of these parts of the process in great detail during this meeting. So I'll just briefly discuss these pieces and how they fit together. The core of the quality equation involves the assessment we make in the initial application. It is pivotal, it's a pivotal part of our rigorous approval mechanism. When we conduct a quality assessment, it means we're going to take a deep dive into reviewing the manufacturing processes, microbiological issues related to product quality and manufacturing, as well as facilities issues. This part of the process also includes thorough evaluations of the drug substance, the drug product, and biopharmaceutics portions of the product application we receive. The goal of this oversight is simple and straightforward, ensuring the consistent availability of safe and effective medications. By identifying and communicating potential quality issues early on, we empower the industry to correct these issues thus reducing the risk of recalls or shortages and improving the chances that we will avoid shortages due to later quality problems as we work to ensure that we will have a supply of quality drugs for the patients who need these drugs. It's a win-win for all involved. We strive to make the FDA the global benchmark for the regulation of pharmaceutical quality. This not only means ensuring that the products themselves are safe, effective, and of good quality, it also means that this standard is built into the production and development process. In other words, it means that it is part of our efforts to foster an entire culture of innovation that includes a focus on quality. To this end, the FDA has pioneered integrated quality assessments and more recently refined our aligned teams approach in which a team of experts evaluates the respective parts of the application in a collaborative environment. As we continue to evolve, we're developing new and even more effective approaches to achieving these ends. For instance, we have spearheaded the Knowledge-Aided Assessment and Structured Application, or so-called CASA initiative, which moves from a narrative format to a structured data-driven risk assessment method. Beyond the assessments themselves, we also play a pivotal role in shaping industry policies, providing beacons to help guide the pharmaceutical industry in their work to guide towards ensuring safety, efficacy, and quality. Policy initiatives include regulations, of course. We're a regulatory agency and regulatory science is a big part of our overall plan. Knowledge in pharmaceutical quality is not static. But these efforts extend beyond simply regulations. They can serve as effective communications with and guideposts for the industry and to support uh, the production of drugs that consistently meet our rigorous criteria. These tools can include guidance documents, international collaboration, compliance programs, and dynamic regulations. 
The goal is to use this assortment of communications so that we can ensure everyone has the opportunity to understand our expectations so that no one has to play catch up. Setting thoughtful policy is critical because this is one of the best ways to communicate our expectations prior to the submission of a drug product application to the FDA. It also ensures that applicants are on a level playing field and have access to the same information wherever they are in the drug development cycle. A testament to the efficiency and efficacy of our policy was our rapid response during the COVID-19 crisis, providing timely guidance on vital topics, ensuring drug availability and quality, even during unprecedented challenges. I was not at the FDA as the pandemic crisis unfolded, but since rejoining, I remain in awe of the, uh, what was accomplished. Guaranteeing drug quality doesn't end at approvals. We actively monitor supply chain integrity, and we're taking steps to do all that we can to keep every drug consistently available and compliant with current good manufacturing practice. Of course, the quality of a drug that's manufactured is of little value to a patient who cannot access the product because of shortage. We've been troubled by shortages going back over a decade, but the pandemic was both an eye-opener and a catalyst for public and political awareness of the issues we face relating to shortages and other supply chain vulnerabilities. We're committed to fostering an environment conducive to strengthening these supply chains, all the while ensuring drug quality. We're working on many different fronts to address these challenges and we'll need collaboration across government and with the private sector to reach a point that shortage becomes a rare thing. This is especially important as more and more life-saving drugs reach generic status. A major gift to the public health for all 340 million Americans, but also for the other 7.6 billion people in this world. In addition to our technical and quality work, we're hopeful that the economics of generic drugs will undergo reform to optimize investment in quality systems. One way the FDA is working to shore up supply chains and provide a basis for needed investment is through developing a quality management, management maturity program, which will incentivize drug manufacturers to voluntarily invest in quality culture. What quality management maturity really means is a state in which drug manufacturers have successfully integrated their business and manufacturing operations with quality practices and technological advancements to optimize product quality, enhance supply chain resiliency, and drive continual improvement. In other words, manufacturers have developed a culture of quality within their own organization. The FDA has already completed two pilot programs on quality management maturity from 2021 to 2022. And currently we're using the lessons learned to help develop a program that will incentivize industry to voluntarily work towards fostering a strong quality culture mindset. We also continue to evolve as the industry does. Anticipating and adapting to technological advancements is crucial to sustaining and promoting a culture of quality. This means understanding tomorrow's innovations today, particularly those involving advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing technologies. These are technologies that will provide more flexibility and agility to the manufacturing process and enable more timely responses to urgent health issues than traditional manufacturing technologies and facilities. We need to understand these technologies and how to regulate them. Our emerging technology program encourages early industry collaboration with the FDA, facilitating transparent dialogues for those employing pioneering manufacturing and testing methods. We also have established the framework for regulatory advanced manufacturing evaluation, also called FRAME, which works to provide clarity and reduce uncertainties for products manufactured with advanced technologies. The goal is to develop a framework of robust regulations to ensure that industry has clear guidance on how to apply advanced manufacturing to their products such as applying artificial intelligence 
and continuous manufacturing to the pharmaceutical industry. Frame will ensure that as the industry progresses, we're right alongside, ready to support and guide. Over the next two days, you'll have the opportunity to collaborate on an exploration of the true meaning of pharmaceutical quality. Together, you'll consider and envision a future where the highest drug quality standards are met with minimal regulatory burden. Your partnership in this effort is invaluable, particularly at a time when we face challenges posed by those spreading misinformation and seeking to undermine confidence in the science on which we reach our decisions and the quality of the industry as a whole. I'm confident that working together, we can enhance trust in science, the industry and the FDA, even as we strengthen and reaffirm our commitment to ensuring the American people have access to the safest, most effective and highest quality medications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Califf, and thank you all for coming today to discuss some of the important aspects of pharmaceutical quality. I am Mike Kopcha, and I'm the director of CEDAR's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, or OPQ. As Dr. Califf has underscored, American patients deserve unwavering confidence in their drug products. The mission of OPQ is to assure that quality medicines are available to the American public. Everyone deserves confidence in their next dose of medicine. Pharmaceutical quality, then, is what assures the availability, safety, and efficacy of every dose. Over the next two days, here at the Pharmaceutical Quality Symposium, you'll be hearing about the essential pillars for pharmaceutical quality, which include quality assessment, quality policy, supply chain, and advanced manufacturing. These pillars are the symposium's session topics, and our presenters will describe our ongoing efforts to assure pharmaceutical quality for the American public. We will kick off today's first session with quality assessment, an essential part in the work that we conduct in OPQ. OPQ's quality assessment approach integrates multidisciplinary insights by utilizing science-driven, risk-based standards to assess regulatory submissions. You'll hear a very comprehensive description of how OPQ is working to advance the quality assessment process with new technology. In addition, we will also touch on patient-focused specifications that incorporates the patient's voice in drug development and evaluation. This is the primary goal of patient-focused drug development. By considering multiple factors, including patient-focused specifications, we are reshaping and reforming the drug evaluation paradigm. Our innovative strategies, as well as the collaboration between regulators and industry, facilitated the approval of many generic drugs, maintaining an impressive on-time action rate during challenging times. As regulators, there were many lessons learned that have increased our agility and response to an evolving world. And one area of focus is applying those lessons to reshape the future of inspections. You will hear some common deficiencies observed in pre-licensed inspections or PLIs for CEDAR regulated products to highlight critical areas to consider for improving quality operations at facilities. Today's afternoon session will cover quality policy. Beyond assessment, policy is a potent tool in our toolbox. Through guidance and other policy documents, we convey the FDA's perspective and thinking on pharmaceutical quality topics. In a complex global landscape, we engage internationally via the International Council on Harmonization, or ICH, issuing guidelines and guidances such as the transformative ICH Q12. You will hear about FDA's recently released guidance to address nitrosamine drug substance related impurities or NDSRIs. Domestically, collaborations like the one between FDA and the United States Pharmacopeia play a pivotal role in developing and upholding quality standards. Product specific guidances or PSGs 
from the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality and the Office of Generic Drugs offer valuable insights for drug manufacturers and exemplify our cooperative approach to policy. Tomorrow, we'll start the day spotlighting Project Orbis, which was initiated by FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence. Project Orbis provides a collaborative framework for concurrent, concurrent submission and review of oncology product applications with other international regulatory agencies. Then we will deep dive into supply chain quality, which concerns many Americans. Supply chain quality issues are one of the root causes of drug substances. In a recent analysis at FDA, what was shown that 46% of drugs newly in shortage were due to quality issues. I've said before that I wish my job wasn't necessary and that all manufacturers could simply be trusted to make quality products. Unfortunately, we must remain vigilant globally which you saw in our swift response to the concerns raised by the World Health Organization, or WHO, over pediatric medicines contaminated with diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol, which killed children in the Gambia. Thankfully, U.S. products were not impacted. But what could have happened if we were not vigilant? We remain vigilant against contamination of all kinds, including from microbial sources. In fact, we have a guidance available to assist manufacturers of active ingredients and finished dosage forms with establishing and meeting microbial quality standards for non-sterile drug products. Our Quality Management Maturity, or QMM, program encourages drug manufacturers to implement quality management practice, practices that go beyond current good manufacturing practice requirements. In addition to QMM, CEDARS drug quality sampling and testing program and site selection model help us maintain surveillance of drug quality. Remember, pharmaceutical manufacturers, regardless of their location, have a duty to ensure that the products reaching U.S. patients are of high quality. The final session of the symposium discusses the potential benefits of advanced manufacturing in the pharmaceutical industry. Advanced manufacturing is, in part, using novel technologies to improve the pharmaceutical manufacturing process and better assure quality medicines are available to patients and consumers. FDA's Emerging Technology Program, or ETP, reduces hurdles for potential applicants by providing a forum for stakeholders to engage in early dialogue about advanced manufacturing technologies with regulators. In concert, CEDARS Frame Initiative aims to provide clarity and reduces uncertainty for developers of products manufactured with advanced technologies. An example of delivering clarity for stakeholders can be seen with the implementation of the ICHQ13 guidance on continuous manufacturing of drug substances and drug products as a final FDA guidance. CEDARS intramural as well as extramural research program has several projects focused on continuous manufacturing, some which include applications of artificial intelligence or AI. You will hear more about AI's role in drug manufacturing as we seek to leverage the advantages of AI for patients and consumers while proactively protecting them from any associated risks. Remember, we work on behalf of U.S. patients and consumers. In closing, maintaining the integrity of pharmaceutical requ quality requires an all-hands-on-deck approach. It's imperative that FDA, along with our stakeholders, use available resources to assure patients have access to quality medicines. And that brings me to my last remark. Regulators or industry cannot assure quality by working separately. Pharmaceutical quality requires our data-driven, science-based collaboration. Thank you for the privilege of your time, and please enjoy the next two days of the symposium. Your next speaker is Dr. Neil Stiber, who is the Associate Director for Science and Communication in the Office of Quality Surveillance, who will discuss the state of pharmaceutical quality.
Good morning. My name is Neil Stiber, and I work in OPQ's Office of Quality Surveillance. It is my pleasure to discuss the state of pharmaceutical quality with you today. We will seek to better understand pharmaceutical quality by looking at OPQ's annual report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. In this talk, I'll share with you the background for the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. We will quickly survey some highlights from each of the past five reports. Then, in a bit more detail, we will discuss the most recent report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, the fiscal year 2022 report. Lastly, we'll look forward to the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality for fiscal year 2023. To advance OPQ's vision and the themes of today's symposium, I would like to emphasize that reliable supply chains provide quality drugs when and where patients need them. This concept is at the core of the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. Let's start by talking a little bit about the background for the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. By providing the public with information on the quality of drug manufacturing sites and their products, the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality supports OPQ's mission and the mission of my sub-office, the Office of Quality Surveillance. The report on the state of pharmaceutical quality has been published annually since fiscal year 2018. All of these reports are available on the website and you can find this website and all of those reports simply by searching for the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. Each report on the state of pharmaceutical quality looks at indicators of quality. These indicators include site inspections, regulatory actions, post-market quality defect reporting, sampling and testing results, recalls, import alerts, and more. The report on the state of pharmaceutical quality analyzes these data to identify trends and insights that provide lessons for FDA and for you, the external stakeholders. The report on the state of pharmaceutical quality also includes a section on commitment to quality that describes programs and tools that will improve quality surveillance in the future. The first report on the state of pharmaceutical quality was issued for fiscal year 2018. It set the foundation for the types of analyses that would become the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. One emphasis has been demographics. As shown by the pie charts on the right, these data help to answer the questions. Where are manufacturers located? What types of manufacturing, whether generic, brand, or non-application products are they engaged in? Another emphasis of the reports on the state of pharmaceutical quality has been the analysis of product quality defects as seen by the bar graphs in the middle of this slide. For the fiscal year 2019 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, we built on those same topics and sought to more deeply understand how inspection outcomes vary by geographic regions, application types, and manufacturing sectors. That is shown by the figure on this page. We also provided results of drug product sampling and testing. And in addition, this report for fiscal year 2019 shared a deeper dive into the citations from CFR 211 that are referenced in FDA 43 forms that describe violations that have been observed during inspections. For the fiscal year 2020 RSPQ, we analyzed the causes for some of the larger recalls over the prior few years. We sought to answer what drove these recalls. One major cause of recalls, which can be seen by the black and gray lines in this chart, was nitrosamine contamination. 
The presence of this carcinogen led to the recall of ARBs that are used to treat high blood pressure. Nitrosamine contamination also led to the recall of ranitidine that is used to treat and prevent stomach ulcers. This graph also shows that in 2020, with the beginning of the COVID-19 public health emergency, we started to see the recall of alcohol-based san hand sanitizers due to methanol contamination. Challenges with alcohol-based hand sanitizers continued into fiscal year 2021. The report of the State of Pharmaceutical Quality for fiscal year 2021 showed the rate of non-compliant products from FDA's sampling and testing. During fiscal years 2019 and 2020, there was a large increase in non-compliant results. These were for impurity testing and were due to products containing nitrosamines. Then, during 20, fiscal, fiscal year 2021, there were many non-compliant results for both assay and impurity testing that were due to alcohol-based hand sanitizers. It is important to note that many of the non-compliant hand sanitizer products were from products that were manufactured at newly registered facilities after FDA issued temporary guidance during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Now let's move to the fiscal year 2022 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. This table shows the location of drug manufacturing sites for countries with at least 50 sites. The CEDAR site catalog includes all manufacturers of application and non-application products. However, it's important to note that the CEDAR site catalog does exclude several types of sites which are managed separately. For example, it excludes medical gas manufacturers. It also excludes registered outsourcing sites under 503B of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And lastly, it excludes manufacturers that, are, that only produce alcohol-based hand sanitizers and who registered during the COVID-19 public health emergency. These types of sites are managed separately and are not included in the CEDAR site catalog. As you can see from this chart, in fiscal year 2022, there were 4,814 drug manufacturing sites in the CEDAR site catalog. That is an increase of 12% from fiscal year 2018. Of interest, 40% of these sites are in the no application sector that indicates that all products manufactured at those sites can be legally marketed in the US without an approved FDA application. Continuing with the fiscal year 2022 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, let's talk a bit about what we call essential medicines. First, let's define essential medicines. Pursuant to Executive Order 13944, which was issued in August 2020, FDA established, a few months later, a list of 227 drug and biological products, which are known as the List of Essential Medicines, Medical Countermeasures, and Critical Inputs, or in short, it's called Essential Medicines. Included in this list of essential medicines are 168 CEDAR regulated drugs. This chart shows that there is a heavy reliance on foreign manufacturing for FDF and especially for API. In addition, the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality shares that 48% of essential medicine products have at least one domestic API manufacturer and nearly 90% of essential medicine products have at least one domestic FDF manufacturer. It is important to note that this analysis is based on counts of manufacturing sites because manufacturing volumes remain uncertain. 
Now let's discuss import alerts and continue on the fiscal year 2022 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. This chart shows the 28 import alerts that FDA issued during fiscal year 2022 for reasons related to drug quality. Based on the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, I would like to share a few observations about these import alerts. First, 89% of these sites that were placed on import alert produced non-application, non-sterile finished drug products. Secondly, most of those import alerts were related to drug quality for sites that manufacture hand sanitizer. It is important to note the role that FDA's authority for record requests under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Section 704 a has on import alerts. Many of these import alerts resulted from those record requests. In particular, the column on the right shows that 10 of these import alerts were for sites that refused to respond to Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act 704A4 record requests. Also, the second column from the left shows that four import alerts were due to current good manufacturing practice, CGMP deficiencies, they were identified through these record reviews. This demonstrates the ability of record requests and their review to identify sites with deficiencies in CGMP compliance and those sites that are unwilling to provide evidence of CGMP compliance. Another key observation from this chart is that the number of import alerts for sites in China and South Korea are disproportionately high. China and South Korea had 43% and 36% respectively of these import alerts, yet they represent only 15% and 4% respectively of foreign sites in the catalog. The vast majority of the import alerts related to drug quality for China and South Korea, 86% were for hand sanitizer manufacturing sites. Continuing our discussion about the fiscal year 2022 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, let's look at recalls. This chart shows recalls over the past five years for specific quality related defect groups. In fiscal year 2022, 166 sites generated 912 recalls. This was the highest number of recalls in five years. As in prior years, the largest defect group for recalls continues to be CGMP deviations, and this is shown on the chart by the light blue bars. Of interest, during fiscal year 2022, there were four specific events that were associated with a total of 37% of all recalls. These four events included temperature abuse for products in storage, a contaminated excipient, and other CGMP deviations. Additional specific information about those recalls are available in the fiscal year 2022 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. Now I would like to share some insights about warning letters from the fiscal year 2022 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. This chart shows warning letters that were issued over the past five years by region or country. In this chart, the US is in black at the top of the bars. In recent years, the share of warning letters issued to US sites has varied. For fiscal year 2022, there are a few key observations. First of all, 68% of these sites for fiscal year 2022 were FDA manufacturers of non-sterile, non-application products, even though these sites represent only 30% of all fiscal year 2022 inspections. A second observation is that 31 warning letters were issued to hand sanitizer manufacturers. 14 of those were issued solely based on methanol impurities that were detected during FDA's product testing. 
For fiscal year 2022, this chart shows an increased proportion of warning letters issued to domestic manufacturers as compared to the prior two years. This was due to the ongoing COVID-19 public health emergency and related travel restrictions. During fiscal year 2022, a high percentage of inspections were domestic, and that corresponded with a higher percentage of warning letters being domestic. Also of interest, going back to fiscal year 2021, we see that there were a large number of hand sanitizer related warning letters issued to sites in Latin America that is shown in yellow. These sites were primarily in Mexico. Details about FDA's warning letters are available through a searchable database of warning letters and information on that can be found via the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. The report on state of pharmaceutical quality also provides updates on programs that FDA has developed and is developing that demonstrate our commitment to quality. These programs will improve our ability to provide quality insight of site and product quality. In particular, the NIP is improving inspections by developing IT systems to collect and manage inspection data. Quality management maturity is seeking to strengthen quality management practices and promote supply chain reliability. And the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act of 2020, also known as CARES, requires reporting of amounts manufactured. These data will strengthen drug quality surveillance. With these advances altogether, FDA will be able to improve inspections and quality assessments to enhance supply chain reliability. It will also help to reduce drug shortages and bolster emergency response. These enhanced risk management tools will enable FDA to better prioritize quality surveillance resources and thereby protect the public from non-compliant products. Overall, we believe that this will increase confidence in the supply and quality of marketed drugs. Lastly, from the fiscal year 2022 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, let's discuss amount reporting under the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act of 2020, also known as CARES. This chart shows the percentage of products for which amounts have not been reported under CARES. The message from this chart is clear. The amount manufactured has not been reported for the vast majority of products across product types. FDA hopes the reporting, repeats, reporting rates will increase and intends to use CARES drug amount data to support drug quality surveillance in a few important ways. First, CARES amount data will enable us to better approximate market share. Secondly, with CARES amount data, we can gain insights on vulnerabilities and dependencies in the drug supply chain. Third, these data will support responses to natural disasters, supply chain interruptions, and potential shortages by identifying alternative manufacturing sites. And lastly, the CARES amount data will help to strengthen the site selection model and better prioritize surveillance inspections by providing an important proxy for exposure to drug products. And now looking ahead, we are currently planning for the fiscal year 2023 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. As in the reports that we have already discussed, this upcoming report will continue to assess quality related data, including product recalls and product quality defect reports to identify trends in site quality and product quality. We will continue to use cutting edge and innovative analytics to analyze data on regulatory actions and product quality testing for insights that can be of value for us inside the agency and can be useful to you our external stakeholders. 
We also plan to share progress about the development and implementation of programs that can better characterize pharmaceutical quality and help assure the availability of drugs. Thank you very much for your time and attention during this presentation. I hope that you've learned a lot about the report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. And if you're interested to learn more, please look up the reports, which are all available on the web. Thank you very much.